Given the previous verses where Paul argues that the law is an interim covenant and is of a different nature than the promise, the question naturally comes, why did God give the law? Paul says it was added for the sake of transgressions. But what does he mean by that? There's a, there's a debate there. The first view is that the law was given to restrain sin. That, that fits with the notion in the text we read about that the, the law is a, is a guardian. So that the, the law somehow protected Israel and it shielded Israel from sin. The second view is that uh, the law was given to define sin. Now, clearly, Paul says this elsewhere, Romans chapter 4, verse 15, where there's no law, there's no transgression. But, but the, the law only defines sin until Christ came. I actually think the best solution here is that the law was given to increase sin. I mean, all of these are true in one sense, if you just think of it generally. But what's the most likely answer in the context of Galatians? I I think that it's unlikely that Paul would say the law restrains sin because I think that would be the view of the opponents. Instead, look at what Paul says about the law in the letter. He says, those who are under a law are under curse. And clearly that curse comes because they don't keep it. And in verses 21 and 22, he says, all are enclosed under or shut up under the power of sin. In chapter 4, verse 5, he says, believers are liberated from the law, but that implies they were previously enslaved to the law. And then we think of Romans chapter 5, verse 20, he says, the commandment was given that the transgression might increase. So I I think Paul's saying here, the law multiplied sin. It increased sin. The other thing Paul teaches us here is that the law lasted until the offspring came, until Christ came. So he shows us again what we saw in the last paragraph, that believers are not under the Mosaic covenant any longer. The law's jurisdiction has ended because the law and the covenant belong together. Now, what Paul says here is astonishing for a Jew. The typical view of Judaism was that the law would last forever. Baruch chapter 4 verse 1 says about wisdom in the Torah, she is the book of the commandments of God and the law that endures forever. So that that was the typical Jewish view that the law would never would never end and that, that Paul speaks of a temporal limit to the law is quite surprising. But we see again the temporary nature of the law covenant. Another interesting point Paul makes here is the mediation of the law through angels. So uh, what is he talking about there? What's the point of what he's saying? Again, that shows the subordinate role of the law. The promise was directly given to Abraham. The law was mediated. I don't think we should read this to say God was absent when the law was given. That's clearly not the case if you read the Old Testament. Some scholars even say that the law was given by demons. I think that's clearly mistaken as well. We have a passive participle here actually in the Greek, and that participle shows who's who's behind the passive participle. I think it's God himself. God is the one that gave the law. Nowhere do we read in the Old Testament, incidentally, clearly that angels were present when the law is given. Well, we may may see that, though, in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 2, at least alluded to. There we read, the Lord came from Sinai, where the law was given, and dawned from Seir upon us. He shone forth from Mount Paran. He came from the ten thousands of the holy ones. There's the reference to the angels with flaming fire at his right hand. A reference to angels is clearer in the LXX, which speaks of the angels with him. Another text from which the same tradition may be derived is Psalm 68, verse 17. So the uh, the idea that the law was mediated through angels 
isn't only found in the New Testament that may be present in Josephus and in Philo, and we see it in other texts in the New Testament. Stephen mentions it in Acts chapter 7, verse 53. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 2 mentions this idea as well. So Paul's not innovating here. He's not saying something that's only unique to him. Who, who is the mediator in this verse? Uh, the meteor, mediator is almost certainly Moses. Uh, uh, the, the, the reference to Moses' hands alludes to the Ten Commandments, which, which Moses brought down from the mountain with his hands. And in fact, in Exodus 32, he, he, he throws the tablets out of his hands when the covenant is broken at the golden cap, but then it's reinstituted by God's grace. So Paul emphasizes the law was given to Moses through angels, and Moses in turn mediated the law to the people. In that way, he functioned as a mediator. This brings us to verse 20. Verse 20 is a greatly disputed verse, one of the most disputed verses in the New Testament. One interpreter says there are 430 interpretations. <laughs> Maybe that's a joke because Paul had just mentioned the 430 years between the covenant with Abraham and the covenant with Moses. So um, I don't think there's really 430 interpretations, but there's a lot of interpretations. I, I, we want to just concentrate on the main point here. The covenant made with Abraham is the superior covenant because it was made without a mediator. Moses mediated between God and Israel, and apparently angels mediated between God and Moses. So the covenant was dependent on both parties fulfilling their responsibility. Uh, here, here I think Paul mentions the oneness of God to emphasize that the Gentiles are included in, in the people of God as well. So again, Paul's argument is the covenant with Abraham is superior. It's not mediated. It's, it's given directly. So Paul's, since really verse 15 has been speaking of this subsidiary, interim, provisional nature of the covenant with Moses, that naturally raises the question, is the law, verse 21, is the law contrary to God's promises? Uh, the law is subsidiary to the promise since it came 430 years later. It also operated on a different principle. It produced transgressions. It wasn't given directly by God to the people. So we might expect Paul to say the law is contrary to God's promises. But he surprises us, as Paul often does. He says, no, it's not contrary to God's promises but it doesn't play the same function as the promise. That's the key. The law isn't the source of life. Hence, righteousness could co not come via the law. The law serves the promise in showing that life only comes through Christ and the gospel. Scripture imprisoned all under sin right? through the law, right? That the promise might come through faith in Christ Jesus. 